But I think there's this push and pull sometimes with anger where it feels really powerful and so you, you go with it. But in doing that, a lot of times, we end up doing something that's hurtful to the people we really care about. And so if you do that, you may feel powerful while that's happening, but very often afterwards, there's this feeling of shame, right? That I just hurt someone I, I really care about. That was Dr. Russell Colts on Psychologists Off the Clock. We are four clinical psychologists here to bring you cutting-edge and science-based ideas from psychology to help you flourish in your relationships, work, and health. I'm Dr. Debbie Sorensen, practicing in Mile High, Denver, Colorado, and co-author of Act Daily Journal. I'm Dr. Diana Hill, co-author with Debbie on Act Daily Journal and practicing in Seaside, Santa Barbara, California. From coast to coast, I'm Dr. Yael Schoenbrunn, a Boston-based clinical psychologist and assistant professor at Brown University. And from sunny San Diego, I'm Dr. Jill Stoddard, author of Be Mighty and the Big Book of Act Metaphors. We hope you take what you learn here to build a rich and meaningful life. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. Psychologists Off the Clock is happy to be partnered with Praxis Continuing Education. With Praxis, you can really transform your clients' lives by learning how to effectively promote lasting change with evidence-based training. And they're really the premier provider in continuing education for clinical professionals. Praxis has both on-demand courses as well as live online courses. They have beginner offerings like Act One from Matt Boone or more advanced offerings like Act Immersion with Steve Hayes. Some of their live online courses include classes in dialectical behavior therapy, superhero therapy, and act with parents. You can get a coupon code for Praxis Continuing Education on our website, offtheclockpsych.com, for some of their live offerings. And we can really attest to the quality of Praxis. We've both participated in it ourselves and have seen its benefits in our clinical work. So visit our offers page at offtheclockpsych.com. Hi, this is Diana here, and I'm really excited to share with you that I've partnered with Mindful.org to host a free online summit coming up on October 15th and 16th called From Striving to Thriving that you are not going to want to miss. It has thought leaders like Dr. Jed Brewer, who's going to talk about the neuroscience of striving, Dr. Kristen Neff, who's going to bring all of her fierceness to talk about how to care for yourself. Dr. Rick Hansen will be talking about aspiration without attachment. Dr. Monica Ramirez-Bosco is going to tackle perfectionism and procrastination. And the dear Paul Gilbert will be there talking about how to shift from competitive drive towards a more compassionate mind. Julie Bogart is going to teach us how to motivate our kids from the inside out. Rhonda McGee will be sharing on the good kind of striving, how to strive for social justice. And Allison Briscoe Smith will be talking about parenting with grace and gumption. I'll be sharing on ACT and how to use ACT to transform striving into thriving. So check us out at from striving to thriving.com. That's from striving to thriving.com. And I can't wait to see you on October 15th and 16th. Anger is the universal human emotion that we all have. And yet sometimes it can get us into some hot water when we don't manage our anger very well or respond to it in a very helpful way. Anger can range everywhere from just that day-to-day irritability and grumpiness, like when you snap at your partner or your kids or coworkers, Or at the more extreme end, it can result in violence, road rage, aggression, yelling. There's really a big range when we're talking about anger. And today we're going to be talking about all of it. This is Debbie, and today's episode is a little different. So the first half of the episode will be a conversation between me and Diana about how we approach anger in our work. Um, We're going to be talking about a behavioral and acceptance and commitment therapy-based approach to anger, and we'll give you some evidence-based strategies that we find helpful. And then the second half of the episode is a segment with our friend, Dr. Russell Colts, who's been on the podcast before to talk about compassion-focused therapy, and he's the author of the Compassionate Mind Guide to Managing Your Anger, and he's going to talk about the role of compassion in anger. This is a topic that's been requested by our listeners in part because a lot of people have been feeling really angry lately. 
with the pandemic and all the stress of the world, people have been reporting irritability a lot in my experience. And actually, I just came across an article in the news. It was a CNN poll, and I sent the article to you, Diana. Um, the poll showed that a lot of Americans from both sides of the political aisle are just reporting that they feel either very angry or somewhat angry about the state of the world right now. And so it seems like a timely topic, always, but maybe especially so right now. Diana, do you want to tell us a little bit about your experience working with anger and what you found helpful in your practice? Well, I love that you brought up that anger feels like it's on the rise. And, and I think that many people will relate to that. I'm hearing it a lot more in my practice as well of just people feeling irritable and frustrated and acting in ways that sort of are not how they want to be acting, whether it's with their kids or with their family members or at work. And some of my favorite tools around anger actually trace back to uh, dialectical behavioral therapy approaches. And we'll talk a bit about chain analysis today and how that's really helpful. But also, I really appreciate Buddhist practices in, in the approach with anger, because it really maps on to act in terms of it's not about necessarily changing anger as much as it is changing our responses when anger shows up. How about you, Deb? Yeah, my work in anger management started a long time ago. I think mostly when I was working with veterans with PTSD years ago, because anger is associated with PTSD. Often people have a very short fuse and get very reactive when they have a trauma history. I'd, I'd often say to my veterans that it feels like you go from zero to 100 in 0.5 seconds. Um, and I think that's how it feels emotionally. But right now I'm doing private practice work, and I do still see a lot of different types of anger in my practice. I think it you know, it shows up for everyone from professionals who are stressed out at work and getting irritable and snappy or people getting angry with family members. And, you know, we don't always manage it very well. One of my favorite tools for working with anger is called an anger episode model. I got this from a book I found really useful called The Practitioner's Guide to Anger Management. We can link to that and a few other books that we've found useful. Um, on the show notes for today. But anyway, the anger episode model really breaks down what's going on with anger. And I love that because I think in my experience, anger can be such a strong emotion and so powerful that it feels overwhelming to people. It just feels like this burst of emotion that's so big and strong that sometimes we don't even know what's going on and it can just feel overwhelming. And so the anger episode model breaks down the chain of events leading up to the anger episode into its components. And by doing that, by looking at it in its pieces, it helps people have a better understanding of what's happening. It helps them slow down and take a closer look. And it makes it less powerful and overwhelming. And that tool is basically kind of like a chain analysis or a functional analysis tool that's really geared toward anger what you're describing is you have this strong experience of anger and then there's all this shame around what you what you sort of did with your anger and so you don't want to look at it again but by not looking at it you actually don't get to learn from it and so chain analysis is a really non-judgmental perspective to break down what happened and oftentimes you pick a incident, like here's an incident for me when I got really angry. I was actually in your episode, Debbie, I think at some point you said that, uh, well, Diana doesn't seem like she gets angry. I, what, what was it that he said? Diana seems like she I has it together. Russell Gold, yeah, Russell Gold said, I think Diana seems like she has it all together. Okay, so yeah, behind closed doors, uh, not so much always. And actually, it's helpful to think about a recent incident when maybe you've experienced anger and to use chain analysis to break it down to to the different components that led up to it, because it helps you see more clearly what led up to your anger response, and then also choose a different response in the future. One thing I just want to add about to uh, research on anger is that the idea that venting and punching a pillow and hitting a wall is a way to release your anger is an old one. And they have definitely disproven that with lots of research studies that date back to the 80s, that at, when you do those behaviors, you just tend to make things worse. And as we do these chain analysis, you can see that sometimes it's sort of like, um, it's like scratching a mosquito bite. It feels good at first, but it just 
inflames the problem and leads to more um, problems than what, what you started with. Yeah, that, it's true. The catharsis model has been debunked, but it's a myth, right? People still sometimes bring it up with me. Like, I just need to get my anger out. And it's like, to me, when I do the work, the goal isn't to vent the anger or to just make the anger go away at all. I think that's unrealistic for most people. I think instead it's more like helping people respond more effectively so they're not doing those things they regret. And to do that, really, you have to pay more attention to anger as it's showing up, like taking a step back to really notice it, notice what you're doing, and then the consequences, the short and long term consequences. So we're going to kind of walk through some of those components. So when you're doing a function analysis, it helps to understand the context. I mean, the anger doesn't just come out of nowhere, but there's a context to why it's de- why it develops and what causes it to rise and get intense. And I think when you really look at the context, you can go way back and think about like, why do we even have this going on in the first place? And I think it's really important to note that anger is wired in, right? It's the fight part of our fight or flight system. It's part of our threat system that helps us defend ourselves. And so that can help you go a little easier on yourself just to recognize that this is a a very normal human emotion that we all have. One of the things that I think has been rising to the surface recently is that people are angry and they're angry for good reason, right? So things like social justice issues or um, oppression or people that are frustrated around COVID and different approaches to the response to COVID, right? There can be reasons why you are angry. And what we're not, we're, what we're going to talk about today is not to undermine those reasons. And in fact, when you do a chain analysis, even understanding some of those reasons can help you be more effective in your responding so that you can really tend to what's underneath the reason, whether it's to defend yourself or something that we need to fix. Yeah, that's right. I think that sometimes we can learn from anger. It points toward something that matters to us. It can point toward something that we care about and which can guide our behavior. I also think it's important to look culturally at at anger expression and what we've learned through our experience about anger. And I think one example of that is gender socialization. I think sometimes men have learned that anger is okay to express but more vulnerable emotions aren't. Whereas girls are often taught the opposite, right? That they shouldn't express anger. They should bottle it up or be more passive or just not feel it at all. So I think it's always an important part of the context to look at at what we learned. And some people out there think of anger as more of a secondary emotion, that if, if you look at anger, it's almost like layers of an onion, that what you see on the surface sometimes is anger. But if you look deeper into the layers underneath it, sometimes it's something more vulnerable, like maybe something scary just happened. Like in the case of road rage, I think sometimes people were scared. And, you know, they just had a really scary situation happened, and they might flip into anger really easily. So I think it's interesting to take a look at what else is going on with anger besides just what you see on the surface. So when I do a chain analysis with somebody that's struggling with anger, the first place I always start with is around vulnerability. And I think it really helps also just an understanding context, right? Because if you're too tired or maybe, you know, for me, an example of a time when I got really angry, it was because I'd just driven in the car for two hours with my kids in the back of the car. I had dinner to make. It was a Sunday evening, school the next day, right? There's all this context that leads me to to get to a place of not being able to regulate my anger very effectively. And being able to know what your vulnerabilities are to to feeling anger or irritability is really helpful so that you can actually sometimes tend to those or say, this is a time when I need to pause and step away. So in the first part of... Um, a chain analysis, getting clear on what, what are your vulnerabilities? What, what are sort of, what's sort of the setup for you? Impatience is a huge one, right? I think so often people are more prone to anger when they're in a hurry or they wanted things to go a certain way and then they get thrown off from that, from their expectations. And then they feel frustrated because of their impatience. Yeah, absolutely. So I have my clients also really as part of the chain to really take a close look at the internal cues that are coming up with anger, their thoughts, their emotions, their body sensations, and anger really, I mean, if you pay attention, you can really start to notice it building up the sensations in your body. What I'm trying to do with my clients is to get the, and myself for that matter, is to get my clients to really tune in and notice that so that they can catch themselves earlier in the ch- in the chain next time. And people can notice like 
feeling hot, feeling their heart pounding. I had one client once who said that she felt like the top of her head was tingling whenever she started to feel angry, which was a really, I thought that was super interesting. And I was like, oh, that's a really good thing to start to notice before you react is that tingling sensation on the top of your head. But whatever it is for you, it's really important to be aware of that. And we can do the same sort of approach with anger that we've talked about in other domains, like bringing curiosity and a stance of sort of like, huh, noticing the wave as it rises, where where along this wave do I, did I actually lose it? And can I uh, do something different than engaging in sort of either suppressing my sensations? You know, I've, I've had clients talk about when they get really angry, they clench their uh, mouth or their their they clench their teeth or they hold their breath or they grip their toes. And actually in doing that, you may be increasing your anger, right? Because you're not allowing that sensation to be there, rather trying to resist it can make it worse. So being aware in that chain of the sensations. And then I think the next next part of it is also being aware of your thoughts, because there's certain types of thoughts that not only can trigger anger, but can keep anger going. And in particular, thoughts that are judgmental, our mind wants to categorize things and simplify things and make sense of the world. But when we get into sort of these global judgments about people, they can be particularly toxic, like a whole group of people are wrong or bad, or the person you're talking to is stupid. It really blocks you from taking perspective or having compassion. And the same is true for blaming or assuming intent. So when we start to get into that cycle of blame and pointing fingers, not only can that sort of block us from taking in the big picture, we just sort of end up defending our territory and get more and more um, self-righteous in our anger. So being aware of your thoughts and how you're actually kind of using your thoughts to feed and fuel the anger and being a mind watcher. You know, we don't have to argue against those thoughts, but we can start to not give them so much power. Yeah. And I think too, we get really tunnel vision when we're angry, where those thoughts like take over. Just the other day I was stewing about something. I was like mad about something going on around the house. And I, I noticed it was like I lost perspective on everything else because I was so zoomed in, like in my head going around and around about how I was right and everybody else was wronging me. And I think that that's a thing to be aware of is when, because that really just gets you really stuck there. You're going around and around it in your mind as if like you, that's all you can see in that moment. I love the classic act chessboard metaphor where you kind of think about there's the black pieces and the white pieces that are battling each other on the board. And when we're really angry, we're just on our side of of the, you know, on our team sort of battling the other side. But in ACT, we talk about how can you be more of the board, right? So that you're observing what's happening on the chessboard, but you're not totally entangled in it. It's just sort of, can you be the board? Can you notice you're in the I'm, I'm right or I'm defending thoughts? And sometimes I can even, when I'm in that place, I can notice that I'm in that place. Like I can even hear my own thoughts going on in my head and then act in a way that's not what my thoughts are telling me, which is pretty profound if you can get to that place of starting to notice that your thoughts aren't always true. It's hard to believe that sometimes when you're really convinced, right? Hey, everybody, it's Jill. If you are a clinician and have been wanting to learn more about ACT, I have an upcoming full-day CE workshop through PESI called Breakthrough Act Techniques and Experiential Exercises, a clinical roadmap to help clients overcome psychological distress. You can either join me live on Friday, October 8th from 8 to 4 Pacific time, or you can watch on demand anytime. To register, just visit my website, jillstoddard.com, and click on Learn from Jill Conferences and Workshops. I hope to see you there. So now we've gone through the chain, we've looked at the predisposing factors, we've looked at the sensations, the thoughts, the emotions that are showing up. And we also want to take a look at what we're doing, right? Our behaviors, our actions in the world when we're angry. And there can be a big range, right? Sometimes we might respond in ways we feel very proud of and we're happy with ourselves at the end of it. Sometimes not so much. And I think we can see also people either getting really aggressive when they're angry, you know, yelling, exploding, getting violent. Others, though, might hold it in and get really passive and like kind of bottle it up and not say anything. And I think actually both can be equally problematic. Sometimes I think people who tend to like never express anger at all and just 
hold it all in, that can also kind of like build up and really um, not be very helpful, especially if it's a situation where saying something would be helpful. There's um, one of the things that uh, Thich Nhat Hanh teaches in Buddhism is the five remembrances. And if you're sort of practicing in Buddhism, you're supposed to repeat these every every morning. And the fifth remembrance is my actions are my only true belongings. And I think that that is so true. Like we we go about our day and the way in which we actually interact with people, the actions that we take, no matter how bad it gets in terms of whatever's happening sensation wise in our body, if we're able to pause and find that space to then choose a different action that lines up, Russell said this beautifully, that lines up with how we want to make other people feel or how we want to be in the world, then that really leads to the, like our true belongings, what are sort of the ground on which, do you know how I say the ground on which we can stand? So I do think that there's in functional analysis, that's really where our power lies. We can't control other people. We can't even control our emotional experiences that might show up. But if we can get enough space to pause and have awareness to then choose a different action, then we can have a different result. Yeah. And when you choose your actions, I think you want to take a look at what's working well for you and what's not working well for you. And over time to kind of move in the direction of what's working well for you. And it's important to understand that by looking at, you know, the consequences of your anger. And that's part of a chain analysis or a functional analysis as well is to look at, you know, how's this working for me in the short term and in the long term. And I think sometimes we do things that actually work in the short term term like avoidance or we do things that make us feel powerful or something like that or it might get the other person to do what we want in the short term and that can be very reinforcing but sometimes in the long term not so much like it might have an an impact on our our lives or our relationships that's really not working for us you know if you're going around being angry and having outbursts all the time or even doing the silent treatment like it's it's hard for people to connect and relate to you so it can start to feel kind of lonely and isolating i really appreciate jed brewer's model around habit loops and you know sort of this idea that there's a cue behavior and a reward and sometimes some of the things that we do that we think aren't rewarding actually are so things like self-righteousness is Re- it's it's rewarding in our brain to be self-righteous. It's highly reinforcing, but that's only in the short term. In the long term, being self-righteous isn't going to make you any friends. And so when we start to focus on the longer term consequences of how we want to be in the world, that also can be rewarding. Being kind and generous is rewarding. It feels better to be kind and generous actually in our bodies. And so one of the things that we can do when we're doing a chain analysis is look at the short-term and long-term consequences and how can we in the moment when we're doing maybe a pause with our anger, remind ourselves the long in the long term, how is it that I want to feel and be in this world and bring that into the present moment to help guide our behavior. And that's really what our values are about, those intrinsic, be- intrinsically rewarding behaviors that in the long run build the life that you want to live. Yeah, that's a big piece of the work that I do is I help my clients think through, you know, if you were to handle this the best way you possibly could or a way that you felt proud of, you know, what what would be your values underneath that? And so that in the future, they have other behaviors to choose from, right? So that they can over time be more values consistent. And the way I often describe it is I want them to respond with intention instead of reacting impulsively or automatically, because I think when it comes to anger, it's it's very prone to impulsive reactive behavior. But if you can be really in tune with how you do want to respond at your absolute best, not that you're always going to get it perfectly right, but it can guide you. And And so that you can continue to repeat that. So because it's not always easy to do that in the moment, that's where the mindful pause comes in. And I really love the work of Rhonda McGee, who wrote The Inner Work of Social Justice, because one of the things that she teaches, so she's an attorney, she teaches law to law students, talk about potential for for self-righteousness, and she teaches about racial justice. So she has conversations about race with a bunch of lawyers or a bunch of law students. And what she really teaches is the importance of being able to slow down and pause when you notice the sensations of self-righteousness or anger or irritability or I'm rightness show up. 
and be able to be with them and make space for your thoughts and your feelings and emotions. And then when you can act from a place of your best self, that's when you act. And I think it does line up with what uh, Russell talked about in terms of sometimes you do need to go into your basement and <laughs> of, of your mind and like take a little break. And sometimes you do need to take a break to be able to actually remove yourself and have that pause before you can act more skillfully. But doing something like a chain analysis after the fact, when you're not in it, and to be able to look at what are your particular patterns, what are your vulnerabilities, what are the thoughts that hook you, what are the emotions that you get flooded by, how do you want to act in the long term, that can help you set the stage for a plan for how you want to rest- respond the next time. And I think sometimes, too, people have some skills that they could work on around that. I often, when I'm working with anger management, will bring in some for instance, assertive communication skills, right? Helping people find the words that they want to use. Because I think sometimes we might either get really aggressive, which is like coming in too hot, or we might get passive and shut down and just avoid and not say anything. And we really want to try to help people find the sweet spot there of of like being direct and clear and speaking up for themselves, but not in a way that's going to make the situation much worse for everyone. I think related to that is also just recognizing that you are not alone when you're in a conversation with someone and you're feeling the heat (laughs) that often they are feeling the heat too. And to have some understanding and compassion that that we'll just, you know, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to step on things. We're not going to always say the, the, the right thing and give some grace to the other person as well, because when we can allow each other to make space and and when we cannot allow each other to make mistakes and not know exactly the right thing to say, but can actually do it from a place I'm just doing the best job I can and trying to come from a place of kindness and caring, then it's going to turn out better in the long run for both, for everyone. Yeah. Well, and I also like to just help encourage people to, to operate from a place of compassion and also sometimes forgiveness. I think sometimes it can be really hard, but we might need to forgive ourselves for things that we've done, especially if we're having anger turned inward, you know, and we also may need to forgive others sometimes. And and to me, that doesn't mean that we won't feel angry or that we forget about what happened, but it just means that we're kind of willing to let go of it and move forward. And I think one of the most vulnerable and powerful things that we can also do is ask for forgiveness when we've made a mistake, whether that's asking for forgiveness from a loved one or asking for forgiveness from, you know, an an acquaintance that that's actually kind of puts you in a place of vulnerability to say, hey, I messed up and I'm sorry. And we need to do, I think all of us could do a little bit more of that. Yeah, I find that actually anytime you can be more vulnerable in your response, it's helpful. I just recently with my husband went from stewing about something and kind of, you know, being pretty angry toward him to actually telling him what was going on inside and what I was upset about in a more vulnerable way. And it completely shifted the conversation. I think that's often the case when people, you know, can be more open and express how they're really feeling. If you're looking for a great way to support us here at Psychologists Off the Clock and make your life easier and healthier, you should go to my new favorite online store, Thrive Market. Thrive Market carries all your grocery and household essentials with the convenience of getting everything online and then quickly shipped right to your door. And right now you can get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift if you go to thrivemarket.com slash POTC. I love that I can use specific filters to curate my shopping experience so I can find organic meats and low sugar snacks for my kids. Plus when you join, they give to a family in need. How cool is that? So join in on the savings with Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. Go to thrivemarket.com slash P-O-T-C for 30% off plus a free $60 gift. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash P-O-T-C, thrivemarket.com slash P-O-T-C. I know I talk about my kids a lot, but I also have two adorable dogs, Tilly and Hazel. We love to spoil them, which is why we love Whole Life Pet. Whole Life Pet makes single ingredient treats, meal mixers, supplements, and hydrating snacks for both dogs and cats. And if you try out Whole Life Pet, you're surprising your pets with fun new flavors while also supporting psychologists off the clock. 
Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off your first order with free shipping over $50. When I open the Tuscan Blend Bistro Bowl meal mixer to add to Tilly and Hazel's food, they start wildly sniffing and can't wait to dig in. The best part is Whole Life Pet uses a freeze-dried process that locks in nutrients and freshness, and they never add chemicals, additives, preservatives, or anything artificial. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off your first order with free shipping over $50. If you're unsure about what to try, you can fill out their short questionnaire by clicking the red Start Today button on the home page. It will ask you a few questions and make custom product recommendations for your pets. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off today. So I talked to Dr. Russell Colts about his stance on anger. Let's take a listen to Russell. Russell Colts has written several terrific books on compassion-focused therapy, including CFT Made Simple and Experiencing CFT from the Inside Out. He's a friend of mine and a friend of the show. He was on the podcast before, episode 50, about compassion-focused therapy, so definitely check that out. Russell, welcome back, and thank you so much for being here again. Oh, thanks for having me. Um, We wanted to invite you back to share your ideas about anger and compassion as part of this anger, anger management episode. And you presented a very personal and powerful TEDx talk specifically about anger. And it's called Anger, Compassion, and What It Means to Be Strong. Highly recommend watching it to our our listeners who haven't checked it out yet. Um, Yeah. So you were just telling me that quite a few people have, you've had quite a um, good response to that TED talk. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've gotten quite a few emails from people all over the world, actually, that'll reach out and and just say, hey, you know, I I saw your talk and it really spoke to me and I've decided to go get some help. I've called the therapist. I'm going to do something about my anger. I'm sort of tired of it, you know, doing things I don't like to my life. And it's really touching to get those messages, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And the fact that they're from all over the world, it just really speaks to how... (sighs) how universal, right? Anger is. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think so. I think so. It's, it's pretty basic to us. And it, it also, I think, speaks to how, you know, it, it, all over the world, we don't necessarily handle it as well as we could, right? It's exactly. not just people in, in the West, for example, who struggle with it. Yeah, that's so true. So true. Well, so one of the pieces of your TED talk is, so it's called what it means, the the subtitle is what it means to be strong. And I think that anger can be a really powerful, strong emotion in a lot of ways, which kind Mm -hmm. of makes it a little bit hard, Mm -hmm. I think, sometimes to, to approach it and to work on it, because there is a surge of power sometimes that can come with anger, but you have a different twist on that. What, What are your thoughts about power and anger? Well, I think, you know, people, people ask me these questions all the time. Uh, they say, but isn't anger good? Isn't anger, you know, it gets you go. And it's like, well, I don't see anger as with any emotions as being good or bad. It's about understanding how it functions. And I think, particularly in the context of current life, anger is a wonderful sign and a terrible strategy most of the time in terms of how it organizes us. Uh, around facing life problems. So anger is really good at getting us off the couch. It's really good at helping us identify, I need to do something about this, right? This is something in my life that that is not okay, or at least is registering that way for me. Um, the tricky bit about anger is that really is, I mean, in, in compassion-focused therapy, we really look at uh, uh, the function of our emotions from an, an evolutionary standpoint. And when people talk about you know, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. Anger is really about that fight response. So it it organizes us, but it organizes our energy in an aggressively oriented way. And and I find that most of the times in my life, the sort of threats I face are very different from what our ancestors faced. You know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, where maybe fighting was was a, an adaptive response. You know, when I'm uh, having a conversation with my wife or I'm in the or the faculty uh, meeting or you know, whatever situation that might trigger my irritability and anger, um, ag- aggressiveness usually is not a very helpful response. And yet that is what anger is preparing us to do. So it can be tricky. It can also feel tricky because it, as you were saying, it feels powerful. It feels really powerful in our bodies and it feel, it can, we can feel strong when we're angry. Um, and again, that, that fits. If you see anger as an evolved fight response, 
right? If that's what we're going to do, we need to feel strong. We need to have conviction around, around being able to move forward. Um, and I think that quality of anger can be seductive, particularly if, you know, I'm someone who doesn't feel powerful in lots of other areas of my life, right? So it's hard to give up. It's hard to say, well, I, I need to work on this because I, sometimes I kind of like it. I kind of like feeling strong like that because, I, you know, I don't feel very strong or very powerful at my job. I don't feel very powerful in my relationship. So if anger is the only way I have to be strong, uh, it's hard to let go. So I think if we're going to expect people to be able to realistically work with their problematic anger, right, anger that's getting in the way for them, we have to give them new ways to be powerful. We have to give them new ways uh, to be powerful in their, in their lives. Uh, we can't just, we just say, well, you know, let's, let's <laughs> get rid of this bit. You know, it's, it violates uh, the dead person rule, which is never ask a client to do something that a dead person can do, right? Which is right. not to ask them to not do something. <laughs> you, that's right. Well, and you know that just trying to focus on avoiding feeling that way is probably, probably not going to do much good. No, no, no. And, and that's actually, I think, why I think compassion plays, can play potentially a really important role in helping people with problematic anger. Because, and shame in this context, I think in a lot of contexts, it can happen really, the effects of it can happen really quickly. It's really painful to make that realization. And so I think very quickly, almost like dominoes falling over, the person can shift from this awareness that I just hurt someone I love to avoidance, to try to alleviate the pain of that awareness. And with anger, I think that often takes the form of things like blaming, but I only said that to you because you did da 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 da, or or rationalizing. Well, you know it makes sense that I would act like that because they did right. So so it doesn't look like avoidance necessarily, but the the function of it is to, I think, to avoid kind of the shame and the the responsibility taking for I just behaved horribly to someone I really care about. Yeah. You're making me think of the term righteous anger. I think there can be so much righteousness to it. Like, well, I'm right. And people can really dig on, in on that. Yeah. And people love it. And, you know, <laughs> I get asked about this stuff all the time. What about righteous anger? What about, and this is, it's a very popular term, fierce compassion. And I, I think that sometimes those things get confounded you know, that righteous anger and fierce compassion, you know, the, the tricky thing about the idea of righteous anger for me is that if we look at the research on hang, how anger organizes our mind, anger always feels righteous. It always exactly. does. One yeah. of the things we see with anger that just goes along with the emotion is a, a, a sense of uh, conviction, right? Your a certainty. And, and uh, you could actually do research on this. You can spit split group people up into two groups and you can have one group think about something completely neutral. Like if you were going to get a new toothbrush, what color would you want it to be? And you can have another group think about something you're really angry about. And then after this group is good and angry, you can have them make a prediction about something completely unrelated. So who's going to win the world cup next year? Right. And they make a prediction. And if you then afterwards ask them, how certain are you of your prediction? How sure are you that your prediction is correct? The angry group certainty scores will be significantly higher than the controls. That just goes with anger. And if you think about it again, if anger's the evolved fight response, right? If you've got a real physical threat that you've got to respond to right now, you want conviction. You want to be able to act immediately. You don't want to be waffling and think, well, gosh, I don't know. Is this the right thing to do? I don't know. So anger always feels righteous. So our ability to gauge whether or not our anger is righteous is almost certainly compromised while we're angry. Yeah. Because it always feels righteous. It always feels like I'm right. I know. That's such a good point. That's so interesting. Cause I, and I think that it's that pausing to ask ourselves almost like, does this matter or yeah. <laughs> who cares? Or am I really right? Because I do think you're right that it's one thing to have a conviction about something that's very values-based and to kind of go toward that thing that, you know, when anger is indicating an injustice, for instance, but it's another thing to just be so convinced that I'm right. And to have it just be this reflexive automatic kind of thing that's where we yeah. get into hot water i think yeah. 
Well, and the other tricky part of that is even as our certainty goes up when we're angry, our focus narrows and our thinking becomes much more rigid and we're much more likely to rely on stereotypes and things like that. And there's research that reflects all of this. So the whole idea is when we're really angry, we're more sure that we're right and we're much more likely to be wrong. Mm. Yeah. And, and so I think having some awareness of that, just to sort of know that, yeah, I know it's going to feel like this when I'm angry, but this is not the time to be making major life decisions about how I'm going to interact right. with people around me if, that I care about because, you know, it's, it's, it's an easy time to do things that I'll regret later. Absolutely. And the cost can be high. So one of the things that you say in your TED doc, just going back to this point you made a minute ago, you say, if we want happy lives and good relationships, we've got to take responsibility for working what we've got with what we've got. So it is, in fact, something that's, you know, wired in, it's a universal human emotion. And sometimes it's not really easy to acknowledge it. You've mentioned shame earlier. And I think that sometimes taking an honest look at you know, at our anger can be, can be really tough. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because if we're someone who struggles with expressing anger in problematic ways, when we, when we really pause and look closely at it, the version of ourselves that we see is often not a very flattering one. It's not a very likable version of ourselves, you know? Um, And, and, you know, I, I think for a lot of us, I know for me, before I sort of said, I have this sort of irritable tendency that I, I need to work with, there was an underlying feeling of maybe I'm just a jerk. I'd see myself responding in these ways. Maybe there's, maybe I'm just a jerk. Maybe there's something wrong with me. And that shame, I, I think that feeling, that thought that there's something wrong with me is one of the most painful human experiences there is. And I think it, it just provokes avoidance so easily. And I think that for, for a lot of people, that's that's why they don't engage with their anger. It's this kind of one, two of, well, it kind of feels good sometimes, kind of feels powerful. And really taking responsibility for it means being honest with myself about some stuff that doesn't feel very good, you know, in terms of looking in the mirror and seeing how I'm behaving. And as I said, how I'm behaving often toward the people I care most about. So would that be, would you describe that as an uncompassionate way of responding to anger? Or what would an uncompassionate way of responding to anger look like? Well, I think, I think, you know, the, the most characteristically uncompassionate way of doing that would be self-criticism or self-attacking when you say, well, the fact that I do this makes me a bad person, you know? Um, And I think that that captures the kind of the tricky bit about shame um shame on an in, on, on a societal level i think shame sure serves some some useful function right it serves to to kind of tamp down behavior that that's unhelpful in a cultural sense right and so we see that when certain problematic behaviors that have been shamed are not shamed anymore right or are are held up then you see problematic you know, these are, which is why we've seen upsurges in, in, I think, various problems the last few years. And I won't, I don't want to politicize things, so I won't go further into that. But at an individual level, I think shame, it, it does shut us down, but in shutting us down, it keeps us from being able to engage with whatever the suffering or the challenge is. If I see that I've, I've acted out in an angry way, and then I think, oh, I'm a bad person, I did that, I'm a bad father, or I'm a bad husband, um, you can even see me as I say, I'm a bad, I'm like, I'm a shrinking. Mm-hmm. He did on the video kind of yeah, yeah, hunched in a little. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it doesn't really motivate us to, to change anything because the, the, the badness isn't about the act with shame. The badness is about it's the inference is about the person, the actor, because I did that, that makes me bad. And if I start with that as a premise that I'm bad, then I can't get any better right? If I'm bad, if that, that defines me, if I'm an angry person, you know, on the other hand, uh, in CFT, we're, we're quite okay with guilt, right? Guilt is I did something that was hurtful, that was unhelpful, and I want to do better. I regret the harm I did, and I want to do better. Um, but even with that, and here again, I think is why compassion and self-compassion is really core to this. That's really painful. It, it means coming into contact with the fact that I've said or done things that have caused 
problems or have caused pain in people I care about. And that's not okay. And that doesn't mean I'm a horrible person. It doesn't mean I can't do better. But it means that that's not the, the version of me I want to be. That's not consistent with what I care about. It's not consistent with my values. It's not who I want to be. And so I've got to do better. And I've got to figure out how to do that. And, and I think if we, if we can approach that with compassion to say, so the, so the motive is how do I help myself be a better version of me versus how do I beat myself up for the things I, I do that don't fit with the person I want to be? I think that opens up a lot of possibilities. Yeah, you can hear even in the language you're using, there's this freedom or or hope or flexibility in that response versus yeah. when you're, you know, when you're talking about just being so self-critical and I'm a bad person, it just feels like there's no way out. Yeah. It's gonna keep yeah. you stuck. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's really for me, that's why I decided to kind of put my toe in the the anger arena. Because quite frankly, I mean, there's there's lots of good anger management tools, techniques out there that we've had them for decades. The, the problem is that a lot of people who struggle with anger don't use that stuff because the shame stops them in their tracks. So if you can get someone to the point where they're saying, I'm going to take responsibility for my anger. I want to help myself be a better version of me. At that point, things really do open up because we've actually got a lot of tools that, that work pretty well. All right. It's yeah. getting people to their point where they're able and willing to use those tools. So give us a little more. This is great. Give us a little bit more of an idea of what that more compassionate view, you know, kind of let's build on what you've already said about it and, and talk a bit about how people could maybe foster a little bit more self-compassion if they're struggling with anger. Yeah. Well, if I was sitting and talking with a person who struggled with anger right now, I'd, I'd probably start by just... Um, just asking them some questions about their experience of it. I, I think that the secret sauce in so many things and in, in self-compassion, quite frankly, is kind curiosity. I think it's that willingness. And of course, the mindfulness people have sort of been talking about this for years. Instead of kind of rushing in, when we, when we see something, we may make up an observation about ourselves or the world or whatever. Instead of rushing in and judging and saying, right, wrong, bad, good, da, 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 da. If we just sort of go, huh, I wonder what's this like? What, what can, if I look really closely at, at this thing, what does it tell me? And is there anything I can learn from that about how to work with it? So if I was talking with someone who struggled with anger right now, I'd say things like, well, you know, I want you to bring to mind, you know, sometimes you've had problems with anger, you know, when that stuff was happening, were you choosing to get angry? Right. Did you think I'm, you know, or, or the angry behavior? Did you pause for a second and say, I'm going to say something really hurtful to my partner? You know, I'm, I'm going to say something to my kid that's going to haunt them for years. Did you decide to do that? Uh, did you say, I'm going to get really, really angry. I'm just going to lose it. Or, or did that just kind of arise in you? Right. Did it just show up? And, uh, you know, I'm. I'm leaving open the possibility that at some point people say, no, I woke up and I said, I'm going to do this, but I've yet to hear that almost, mm. you know, the, 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 uh, regularity with which people will say, it just showed up. It just, it just took me over. Right. It's just like, I, I opened my eyes and I found myself on a train and it had already left the station and blah, there it went. And I think just little observations like that, like, okay, I didn't, I didn't choose that reaction. That doesn't mean I'm not responsible for it, but I, you know, particularly the, the harm that was done, I didn't choose. I'm going to, I'm going to do that. Most often it's this experience of being caught up in emotion that they don't know how to manage. And then that plays out in a lot of sort of ways. And then I might ask other questions. This is one of my, my favorite ones, this, you know, and this doesn't just apply to anger. It applies to everything. Um, you know, given what you know about you, Right. I'll ask people, you know, bring to mind a situation you struggle with, a problem you've had around anger, or really around anything, you know, given what you know about you, the, the situation in which you grew up, uh, the things that were modeled for you, the things you've learned, the things you were taught, the things you didn't learn and you weren't taught, the things that happened to you, the normal things, the traumatic things, all of it. Right. When you look at all of that, and you consider this 
struggle or this bit of suffering or this problem you had, does it make sense that you would struggle with that? Does it make sense that you would struggle with exactly that? Now, although people don't always realize it at first, the answer to that question is always yes. And the reason it's always yes is that by definition, our struggles occur within contexts in which they make sense, which is why I struggle with some things that you don't struggle with. And I suspect you may struggle with things that Diana doesn't struggle with. And maybe Diana doesn't struggle or struggles with things that I don't struggle with. She seems like she's got it together. So I have a hard time picturing Diana struggling, but who knows? <laughs> she does, trust me. <laughs> so, 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 and I think once people can begin and, and you know, those little Socratic questions, they, they kind of get at some of the not your fault realizations that underlie CFT. And, and by, the, by not your fault realizations, I don't mean that we're, we're letting ourselves off the hook for responsibility for our anger or anything else in our lives. But it's about just sort of honestly taking a reckoning of your experience and, and noticing what are the parts that I chose and designed and, and, and you know, which are the parts that just sort of played out in my life in a way I didn't choose, but which create lots of challenges for me. And if people can kind of recognize, okay, I didn't choose to lose it on my kids. In fact, I regret it. Uh, and I know how I learned that. I remember when that happened to me. I, re I remember seeing that modeled. You know, it's no surprise that I struggle with that. That's the beginning of self-compassion. Because in, instead of blaming and attacking, you're bringing understanding and for me, when people ask, how can you have compassion for this? How can you have compassion for that? How can you compa have compassion for these people that do these horrible things, this, that, and the other? If I start with the act, right? If I start with the crime, if I start with whatever the thing is, um, it, it's hard to connect with compassion. If that's, you know, the representation of this being in my mind is the person who did that thing. If that's the only thing I know about them, then compassion is hard to contact. But we know that's never the case, right? We know that people are not the worst thing they've ever done, right? We know that people are not their worst tendency. We know that behind that is this whole constellation of causes and conditions in which those acts make absolute sense. And if we can bring understanding to that, I find that compassion and empathy and all that can begin to arise because it's like, it doesn't just make sense to them that they struggle in this way. It makes sense to me. It's like, wow, now I can see you know? Yeah, that's so beautiful. I mean, I think that's such a beautiful question for people to and to ask themselves and also toward others, you know, to kind of understand we're all doing the best we can here. We all have complex, you know, biology and history and context in which we're, we're living. And I think that really opens up to that common humanity sense. Yeah. What, what if we did that? What if we took that as sort of a guiding principle that before we let somebody have it, because they said something that we just really don't like, or we really don't disagree with, or we really disagree with. What if we assumed that in their lives, in a area of their lives that we probably don't have access to, there's a context in which their behavior makes absolute sense. Right. But because that's actually the way it is. Right. Um, and that doesn't mean people don't make decisions that we don't disagree with. Of course they do, right? But but again, if we can help, if we can begin with trying to understand rather than judging or dismissing or labeling, I, I think it uh, leaves a lot more possibilities open. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Now that's trickier said than done because we have our own threat stuff too. So when their behavior triggers us, right, then our anger or whatever kicks up and then we go into certainty and we get rigid. And so that's why I think compassion in CFT, we talk about three flows of compassion, right? Self to other, uh, our ability to, to relate compassionately to others, self-compassion, our related ability to bring compassion to ourselves, and then other to self, our ability to receive compassion, to, to reach out and to, to, to allow others to, to be there for us when we need them. And what most people find is that there are some of those flows that feel pretty natural. And then there are others that are, that are very tricky. You know, you kind of find where your growth edge is. Um, Which I think is we, the hardest for people, do you think? 
I, you know, I think it depends on the person. That depends on the person. It. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm very resistant around putting rules around that kind of stuff. Sometimes, you know, we have <laughs> we have a lot of like nice sounding cliches that people say in our culture that sound really good until you sort of put them under the microscope. So for example, I, you may have heard people say, you can't love anybody else unless you love yourself, right? And it sounds really good to hear. And I've even heard people say that about compassion. You can't have compassion for anyone else unless you have compassion for yourself. And I think that's a load of hokey because I know literally hundreds of therapists who have shown me that they genuinely have almost boundless compassion for others and they really struggle with having it for themselves. I agree. I mean, I, I think you're right. There's not a one size fits all model here, but I do, I can think of a lot of people that have no problem having compassion for others, for animals, for kids, for people in their lives. But when it comes to themselves, it's much harder. Yeah, that internal and, and, you know, because maybe they had, you know, somebody in their life that that, you know, kind of gave them a gift of a really critical, harsh inner voice. Yeah, that's right? right. So when they when they hear themselves, see themselves struggling, then they start beating themselves up, you know, um, and th these processes, at least the research seems to indicate they're related, but they're not the same. Right. Kind of different things are happening when we relate compassionately to ourselves than if we relate compassionately to others or if we can receive it, you know, and particularly receiving, then that gets at attachment dynamics that again, you know, most of which, you know, have their origins in the very first years of life, but can make it very tricky, right. For people to, to receive help or to rely on it and trust it, feel comfortable allowing themselves to be helped. It's tricky. Well, I really appreciate this point of view about anger, and I, I thank you for talking to us about it. Um, I think it's a really wonderful starting place to even just shift the whole conversation with yourself about your anger. And that, like you said, that really opens you up to get into these more, to delve into some strategies and resources that might help you in those moments when things get hard. Yeah, that's actually that's actually a wonderful segue into a second question. Sometimes one of the things whenever I do talks like this these days, I always if if I leave people with anything, I want to leave them with two questions. I, I call this self-compassion in two questions. So the first question is the one I already asked you. You know, pick a suffering, pick a thing you're suffering or struggling with, a thing you're having a hard time with, and ask, given what all the stuff I know about me, does it make sense that I would struggle with this? The answer uh, to which is yes. Once you've sort of asked yourself that question and sort of acknowledged, oh yeah, I can see, you know, this is, this is why I struggle with this. The second question is given that, given that I am struggling with this thing and it makes sense that I would, what would be helpful? Now, I think that's one of the most powerful questions we can ask ourselves, what would be helpful? Sometimes people misinterpret the question as what would be helpful to solve the problem? And a lot of times, uh, those of us who pay attention know that most of the big problems that we struggle with in our lives don't have a quick, easy fix, right? So if we think what's going to solve this problem, like right now, oftentimes the answer is, well, I can't do anything. Let me go give up. Often when we observe that we're really struggling with this problem that maybe we can't change, if we ask ourselves, well, given this, what would be helpful? The answer is really about what would help me like be the best version of myself while I struggle with this inherently difficult situation? What would help me be as comfortable as possible while I go through this really difficult experience? But I, I think that when we ask ourselves that question, one, you know, maybe we'll come up with some, some things that actually will be helpful, but even more powerful, I think, is the shift uh, in, in, in compassion-focused therapy we're all about trying to get people to connect with this basic caregiving motive that we all have in us that, that goes back to the very dawn of mammalian life. Mammals had to learn how to care, how to take care of their youngs, or, or we wouldn't survive because our young are just completely helpless. So, mm -hmm. if, you know, if, if, if caregivers don't take care of babies or baby cats, baby dogs, baby monkeys, all the mammals are the same. Birds, interestingly, develop this in parallel to us because they're young or help, helpless too. If we don't care for those needy others, they don't live, right? If we're not cared for in infancy, we die. So we've got that all within us. 
but it gets covered up with all this threat stuff so often. So every time we ask that question, you know, given whatever the problem, we see the suffering, the problem, the struggle, whatever it is, and we go, given that, what would be helpful? Just that question, what would be helpful, grounds us back in that caregiving motive. And so our, our focus isn't on avoiding the pain. It isn't on attacking what we might perceive as the source. It's about looking at the situation and honestly trying to figure out what would be helpful here. Is there an action I could take? Maybe it'd be helpful to just pause and try and figure out what's going on, you know. But at that point, lots of possibilities show up. So I find myself increasingly, as I get older, being kind of, kind of less less caught up in what are the specific techniques about doing this mm-hmm. and that and having tried, well, we can figure those out. But if I can get person a person grounded in that question to look at their struggle and go, wow, that's really hard. What would be helpful? Mm-hmm. I think a world of possibilities opens up. I love that. Let me ask you a slightly personal question because you you talk about in your TED talk about your own some of your own history and struggles yeah. with anger. So could you yeah. give an example of something that you have found useful? Like if you were in a moment when you're getting riled up and, and you ask yourself that question, what do I need right now? What what's one thing you might have? So it, it depends on the level of the anger. Right. So I, I think that. If it's, if it's, I'm getting irritable or I'm getting snappish or, or those sorts of things. Uh, one thing that's really helpful to me, and I try to ask myself this fairly frequently is how do I want other people to feel in my presence? When I'm around my family, my colleagues, my students, what impact do I want my presence or my absence to have on them? Do I want them to feel threatened? Do I want them to feel safe, right? Do I want them to feel insecure? Do I want them to feel validated and valued, right? And I find that actually when I reflect on what I really want for other people, not just even people who are close to me, but everybody, I find that, you know, if I connect with my values around that, uh, I want people to feel safe. I want people to feel okay with themselves. I want them to feel heard and valued. That's how I want the people around me to feel. And that's the experiences that I want my presence to trigger in them. That, that's, you know, what I care about. And so if I can ask myself a question like that, you know, like, how do I want them to feel? What impact do I want them to have? That grounds me. I think that that shifts me pretty powerfully back to, to where I want to be. Now that, that works when I've got a little bit of irritation or I'm a little snappy and I'll, so they'll go and I'll say, I'm going to go again, I get a cup of tea or whatever and, and try to try to reconnect with the version of me I want to be. Um, people frequently ask me if I'm in full rage, if I'm, you know, that something's triggered me and I'm going, what do I do? Right. They want some technique or some practice or some little bit of advice that boom, they'll be chill. They'll be cool. And maybe that's out there. I don't know, but I haven't found it yet. I don't know. I don't think there's anything like that. So for, for me, and it doesn't happen very often, but you know, once every two or three years these days, some, something will trigger me and I'll, ooh, I'll be really mad. And when that happens, I've got to create distance between me and other people. That's when I say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go for a walk or I'm going to go and I'm going to go down. I've got a room in my basement that's basically the dream bedroom of my 16-year-old self. So it's got guitars on the walls and albums, hundreds of albums and stuff like that. And I'll go in there and put in music. And there's a story I've, I've told several times because it really captures this for me pretty nicely. Um, there was one day, it was probably three or four years ago now. And my wife and I had kind of gotten into it. I don't know what had happened, but, you know, it wasn't, I don't even remember it. It obviously wasn't that big a video, but for whatever reason it triggered, I was really angry. And so I caught it. I observed it and I said, I'm, we will talk about this later. And I went downstairs, went in my music room, put on a record and uh, closed the door. And I'm just sitting there and I'm gradually, you know, kind of trying to work my way back to the version of me that that I want to be when I'm around my family. And after about 15, 20 minutes, uh, my wife, Lisa came and knocked on the door and opened the door and poked her head in and, and, and very kindly said, are are you, are you ready to talk now? You know, kind of put a bid out to reconnect. 
And I, I wasn't. And I looked up at her and I said, no, um, I'm not, I'm not ready to talk yet. You know, cause I was still, I was still right up in it. And, and her face kind of dropped a little bit. And I said, I want you to know though, that when I, I close that door, I'm not shutting you out. I'm shutting me in. Cause right now, there's nothing that's going to come out of me. that's going to be helpful. Yeah. And I need to find my way back to that b- before, before we move forward and talk about this. And she heard that and understood it and, and, you know, closed the door back. And then I flipped the record over, listened to the rest of it. And after about another 20 minutes, I was, I was ready, you know, and I could reconnect. And so I think in those situations, you know, I think sometimes the best thing we can do is just to sort of recognize, I, I just need to create some distance. Yeah. Right. I need to not, yeah, I'm on fire and I need to not set anything around me on fire. So how do I, yes. how, how, do yes. I how do I, how do I do that? And, and then I think when we do that, if, if all we need is that bit of recognition and then to create some distance. And then I think that gives us the space to kind of find our way back. And, and, the way we use that space is really important too. If we use that space to ruminate and go back over and fantasize and imagine and play the situation again and again, we can just, we can fuel the anger indefinitely, right? Because the emotional center of our brain, your amygdala, our amygdala doesn't really, it's not very clever. It doesn't know the difference between stuff that's going on out here and the images I'm creating in my mind. So that's the other thing. When we create that space, and we notice ourselves ruminating, thinking about the situation again and again, or playing it over or fantasizing aggression, we need to go, whoa, 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 that's, that's keeping me here. And then in that moment, for me, I think distraction is really useful, putting on a record, playing guitar, or going for a walk or something like that. I think sometimes in the behavioral sciences, distraction gets a bad rap. People say, isn't that bad? Isn't that avoidance? And the answer is, well, it can be. It's about the difference between form and function of a behavior, right? The, yeah. the form is what the behavior is. The function is what effect does it have? And uh, distraction is avoidance if we never come back to the situation, right? If we've got a problem and we say, oh, I don't want to deal with that. And we go over here and do something else. And then we kind of forget about it and keep moving with our lives. That's avoidance. And in the long term, that's going to create a problem, right? Because when we avoid our problems, they don't go away. They go to the gym and work out. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah. On the other hand, distraction as a coping mechanism to give ourselves time for the arousal to come down, to, to get back to a, a, a kind of a better version of ourselves with the full intention that when we do that, we're going to come back and work with whatever the challenge is. The function of that is about soothing. It's about kind of kind of grounding ourselves so we actually can do a good job of working with the challenge. So in that case, I think, you know, it can be helpful. Yeah. I appreciate that example um, a lot. Cause I think we, sometimes it is so tempting to just do something really impulsively. That's going to make the situation so much, you know, that's it. I'm out of here. I hate you. Whatever the case may be, punch someone road rage, you know, the whole, there's so many things we could do. And instead to, to kind of shake things up, to get some perspective, to allow ourselves some flexibility in those moments to have a space. And, and if it's a, like you said, if it's a day-to-day thing, just that a pause might be helpful, but if it's a yeah. big thing, you know, we might really need to shake things up. And I think, you know, just that tendency to stew on it, to circle around and around with it, it just doesn't get us anywhere. And so yeah. whatever it yeah. takes to break that up is helpful. Absolutely. One thing that can be helpful with that too is getting to know how anger works really well so we can understand our own experience. And the reason is anger, in addition to the certainty we talked about earlier, carries with it a felt sense of urgency. It's just a part of the emotion. So when we're angry, there's a feeling that I have to do something about this right now. Now, and and this is why it's so hard to resist sending that email or saying that thing, because we're feeling it. And again, if it's the evolved fight response, right, you want to, you know, if you're being attacked, you've got to fight now. You can't, you can't, well, I'm going to hold up and think about this. Um, So, so we feel like we have to respond. And I think that if we, we learn a little bit about how anger works in us, when we feel that we can ask questions like, okay, is it actually true 
that I have to respond to this right now or something more bad will happen? Or is that urgency just a part of the anger? And what I find is it's usually the second bit. It's usually like, oh, of course I'm feeling that like I have to respond right now, but that's not about the situation. I don't, I can send, I can respond to this email in, uh, in a week if I need to. I'm, the feeling is coming from the anger. So maybe give myself some space. What would be helpful? Because I think that, I think that reflecting on what's important to me, what, how do I want to be for the people around me? I mean, that's all values stuff. And if we yeah. can connect with that, you know, that can be the motivator that helps us say, I, I, you know, I'm going to go take a walk <laughs> you know, or right. I'm going to go whatever. Yeah. I think the values can really um, guide our, be our guide in those moments when we're not sure what to do and we might get ourselves into trouble. And it can actually, of course, Matt and Jen Vallat can tell you about this, you know, uh, extensively. It can also, you know, working with anger is tough. If you're someone who really struggles with anger, it, it's, it's, it's an ongoing sort of thing. And for many of us, it's a lifelong kind of thing. And, you know, what the, the RFT people will tell you is that if we want to motivate difficult, ourselves around doing difficult behavior, connecting with a higher order value can keep us going. Right. Yeah, if we're, totally. we're, we understand that I want to be like that, that can keep us working even when it gets hard. And when you're working with anger, it will get hard and it'll stay hard. Yeah, that's so true. So true. Well, thank you, Russell, so much for joining us again. And I love hearing your thoughts about this. I think this is going to be really helpful for people. Thank you. Oh, great. Well, thanks for having me. It was great fun. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. If you enjoy our podcast, you can help us out by leaving a review or contributing on Patreon. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts and you can connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'd like to thank our strategic consultant, Michael Harold, our dissemination coordinator, Katie Rothfelder, and our editorial coordinator, Melissa Miller. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and is not meant to be a substitute for mental health treatment. If you're having a mental health emergency, dial 911. If you're looking for mental health treatment, please visit the resources page of our website, offtheclockpsych.com.